Hi everyone, welcome to our brand new event, or more specifically our brand new mini-series, Palace of Science Presents Diversity in STEM. So for any of you um, that are not familiar with Palace of Science, we are a not-for-profit science engagement group and we hold a host of events um, that aim to showcase the science and research happening in the northeast of England and most importantly to be able to bring that to a public audience like yourselves. Um, so whereas most of our events tend to involve scientists speaking to us and presenting their work, the hope was with this mini-series, Diversity in STEM, that we take a bit of a, a deeper look into the, the background of the sort of STEM fields. So look into their history and their practices to try and really get an idea of what makes those fields what they are today. And as well, uh, most importantly, about the people um, that have worked and do work in those fields as well. So as I said, this is a brand new uh, mini-series. So new, in fact, that... Um, I am very much interested in hearing your thoughts and ideas on this, if anyone uh, would like to collaborate or has any ideas about what they would like to hear about, that would be really great. But for tonight's event, um, we're going to kick this mini-series off um, with a really good topic, so the forgotten women in science. So our speaker this evening is Clarissa Barrett. Clarissa Barrett. She, she is a is PhD, a PhD student, student in theoretical, in theoretical physics, physics at Newcastle, at Newcastle University. University. And her and talk her actually, talk actually came really, came really highly, highly recommended, recommended by a couple, by a couple of people. Of people. Um, so, um, so, I'm so I'm excited to hear it. I haven't, I haven't heard, heard it before. before. Um, and, um, I and I think it's going to be a really perfect, perfect way, to way to share this topic, topic with, the with the audience. So after the talk, there will be a question and answer session. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will come to them later. Um, but for now, um, I think that's everything I have to say. I'll be back after the talk to give you a bit more information about some other events. Um, but I will hand over to Clarissa to tell us about some of the many forgotten women in science. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, hello, I'm Clarissa. Um, and it probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of you that throughout history, there have been numerous instances of women being overlooked in favour of male colleagues and of other people taking credit for their work. Um, and maybe uh, fairly obviously from uh, the description, uh, this is something that's quite important to me and um, something that I really wanted to learn more about. And I thought a great way of learning more about it was researching it and putting it into a talk and, and telling other people about it. So um, that's, that's why I'm here doing this. Um, and I wanted to take the time to look at some of the women and give them the spotlight that they deserve um, because I, 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 I want to look at some of the science behind their discoveries as well because um, I want to make sure that these women aren't just remembered for being forgotten. I want them to be remembered for the amazing science they did because um, it changed lives what these people did and, and they don't deserve to be forgotten in the way they were. Um, so this isn't just a... Um, historical problem and it's not just a problem in science. Uh, some of you might remember from 2016 during the Olympics there were a lot of uh, people who were being referred to um, with regards to their partners. So for example wife of uh, Bears linesman won a bronze medal in the Olympics because it's not good enough to do it yourself, apparently. Um, and even Hillary Clinton isn't safe. She was uh, running for president and the headline had a picture of Bill Clinton above it um, instead of herself. So uh, it's a problem that's still very much going on. Um, it's actually got a name um, because it's such a, a, a common thing. Uh, the Matilda effect is the lack of acknowledgement of women scientists whose work is attributed to male colleagues. Um, so... This was actually first described in 1870 by Matilda Justin Gage. Um, so it's actually something that people have recognised happens for a really, really long time, even back as far as when, um, you know, it was women weren't even really publishing things, or were they? Because, you know, they were having to publish in, in the pseudonyms or um, with their male colleagues' names because it was the only way they were able to get their work published. Um, and the term itself was actually coined in 1993, um, so only 27 years ago. Um, and actually, when I was trying to come up with 
um, the people to include in this presentation, there was just so many people, it was quite difficult to narrow it down. So I've come up with a list of honourable mentions as well. Um, and these are people whose science I'm not really going to go into, um, but I thought it would be better. Um, uh, sorry, I thought it would be good to include them. Um, so first off, we have Marianne Diamond, who discovered brain plasticity. Um, so how brains change when you learn. Um, and she, uh, originally when they tried to publish the paper, her name was missed off the list entirely. And she quite rightly argued against that. Um, and so later it was added to the paper, but it was added in parentheses at the end. It wasn't actually included as uh, a name in the full list of authors. Uh, then we have Jocelyn Bell-Bunnell, who you might have heard of, who discovered the first radio pulsar. Uh, and in 1974, Nobel Prize was awarded to her supervisors um, and she wasn't included. Um, her, she herself has said that's actually fine because uh, graduate students shouldn't win a Nobel Prize, um, but it does still, you know, not sit quite right with a lot of people. Uh, Esther Lederberg developed a way to transfer bacterial colonies between Petri dishes. Um, and she actually worked a lot with her husband, um, who also worked in the same research and was quite a well-known name in the same research. And this might have been a bit of a curse for her um, because it ends up, he's always the one that's remembered. And again, the Nobel Prize that was awarded to her husband and two other men from different institutes, um, and she wasn't included. It can only be awarded to three people, um, but even so, you question who should have been included on it. And then Rosalind Franklin, who used X-rays to photograph DNA, um, when an extra person came in to help, she was actually mistaken for an assistant in the group that she led. Um, and her photo was showed by this person at conferences without her knowledge. Um, and then the 1962 Nobel Prize was awarded to Watson, Crick and Wilkins, the other three that did the research. We will never actually know if she would or wouldn't have been awarded that because Nobel Prize Nobel Prizes are never awarded posthumously, um, and she sadly died before 1962 when it was awarded. So we don't we don't know that she wouldn't have been included, but we can maybe guess. Um, so speaking of the Nobel Prize, uh, you've probably all heard of it. Uh, it's a one million dollar prize uh, established in 1895, first awarded in 1901. Lots of people have won it. Uh, we're going to sp focus specifically on physics and chemistry here. There are a few. Um, it's been awarded 113 times physics and 111 for chemistry to the number of people. You can see there, 212 and 183 people. Um, and of all of those people, three of the physics ones were awarded to women and five of the chemistry ones were awarded to women. Um, and actually the first time that both of them were awarded to women in the same year was two years ago. Um, which to me just seems completely mad given it's been going for over 100 years. And it's also probably worth pointing out that the uh, of those, that's not actually eight women because Marie Curie won both. So that's actually only seven women um, that have won the physics and chemistry. Not that that's a bad thing that she won both, but you know, still only seven women. Um, so I should probably move on and tell you about some of the people. Um, so when I first made this presentation, I was trying to decide who I should include. And I originally questioned whether to include Katherine Johnson because she absolutely fits the bill for the people that I wanted to include in this because she was forgotten for so, so long. But then the film Hidden Figures came out in 2016. So now she's maybe a bit better known, but only because you know someone made a film about her four years ago. Um, so I wanted to include her anyway. And actually, when I first gave this talk, um, it was the week that she died at the age of 101. And so I added in this to talk about her and I wanted to keep it in because she's just fantastic. Um, so her math, she was one of the mathematicians for NASA who computed trajectories for different space missions. Um, her mathematics was so good that when uh, NASA first got computers in, electrical computers, she was asked to double check the computers uh, because they trusted her more. Um, she actually received a Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015, which is what's pictured here um, for her service. Um, women weren't actually allowed their names on papers when she worked for NASA. Um, and her supervisor actually tried to get uh, her colleague who was writing one of the papers, Ted Skopinski, to stay and write the paper. He was moving on to a different position and he wanted him to stay and write it so Catherine wouldn't. 
Um, and to his credit, Ted Skopinski did say, Catherine did most of the work anyway, let her write it. And so she did and became the first woman in her division to have her name on a published paper. Um, other things she did, she calculated the trajectory for the 1969 moon landing. Um, she enabled the safe return of Apollo 13 astronauts. Um, she tra uh, calculated the trajectory for the first American in space, Alan Shepard, and for John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth. And actually, there's a quote from him there. If she says the numbers are good, I'm ready to go. Um, there was a discrepancy in the numbers before his flight, and he refused to take off until Katherine Johnson had okayed the numbers, um, which is quite fantastic. Um, so next up, we have Liza Meitner. Um, so she was born in Vienna in 1878, and she was one of the people that led the group that discovered nuclear fission with Otto Hahn and her nephew, Otto Frisch. Um, and she had quite a few things working against her because she was also Jewish in 1938 Germany, and she actually had to flee the country um, while they were researching. And a lot of the research people who had been researching for her, uh, with her Although they did help her to escape the country, uh, they also then stopped researching for it. And that was a safety thing for them and for her. They didn't want to bring attention to her, but it meant that she never got the acknowledgement that she deserved for the work that she did. Um, and so in the end, only Otto Hahn received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of fission of heavy nuclei. Um, she actually went to uh, the university in Berlin. And um, I like the fact that I, I read this as... Uh, Max Planck allowed her to go to his lectures, which was very generous um, because usually women weren't allowed to go to his lectures. And she actually ended up working as his uh, associate before um, heading up the group with Otto Hahn, unsalaried um, as a guest in Hahn's department, despite the fact that she was really working with him, not for him. Um, so I said I was gonna tell you a bit about science as well as, as the people. So I'll tell you a little bit about nuclear fission. So nuclear fission is essentially the idea that you have radioactive nuclei that are unstable, so something like uranium showed here. You fire a neutron, which is a neutral uh, particle that makes up a nucleus, at it, and it releases a huge amount of energy and then splits off into two different nuclei um, and some other neutrons. In a nuclear reactor, which is a controlled reaction, you have control rods, which will block off some of the neutrons um, and only let one or two through, which means that you get a controlled, it's not a runaway explosion, which is exactly what happens in a nuclear bomb. They don't control it. And every time a neutron hits another uh, nucleus, um, it creates more and more and more energy until you have this, this huge explosion. And that's that happens in a, a fraction of a second. Um, so... For a while, it was thought that actually firing a neutron made a new uh, at the nucleus that they didn't know about. Um, so like it was making bigger ones because you were adding something. So sure, that makes sense. Um, but after a while, it was realized that that wasn't happening at all. They were consistently seeing this much smaller nucleus. Uh, and they thought, thought at first it would be radium. Um, but it was actually Liza Meitner that established that um, it was well predicted that the leftover element that they were seeing was actually barium um, instead and that they were splitting the atom. Um, it was too big for it to have been uh, radium getting bigger. Sorry, radium's too big and it was getting bigger and so they realized it was getting smaller. So she predicted it must be barium instead. Um, and actually Otto Hahn published the work on his own without uh, Meitner. And then later Meitner wrote a letter to the publisher explaining some of the stuff that Hahn hadn't been able to explain in, in the paper. Um, and she's the one that coined the term fission, um, but she didn't receive the Nobel Prize alongside Hahn, despite the fact that it was actually her that came up with the name um, and explained the work. So next up, Alice Ball. Um, so Alice Ball is someone who I actually only learned about recently. Uh, and I thought her story just, it's, heartbreaking and frustrating and fantastic all in one go. Uh, so she was born in Seattle in 1892 um, and she went to university and she obtained a degree in pharmaceutical chemistry in 1912 and then two years later received another one in pharmacy in 1914 which is quite frankly making the rest of us look bad. Um, and then she after doing this was inundated with uh, scholarship offers and she chose to 
go to uni- what was then College of Hawaii, is now University of Hawaii. And she became the first African-American and the first woman to graduate with a master's in chemistry in 1915 at the age of only 23. Um, and became a lecturer in chemistry at 23 as well, and was the first woman to do so in chemistry um, at the University of Hawaii. Um, So what do we know her for? So she was one of the first people to come up to really make a treatment for Hansen's disease, which we probably all heard of, but you might have heard of it called leprosy instead. Uh, So it's a horrible disease which um, resulted in people the nerves not working the skin. So if any damage happened, if they cut themselves or anything like that, um, it would just get infected, you know, because you wouldn't notice. And it meant that, um, you know, people's limbs would would just, bad things would happen. Wasn't very nice. Um, I won't go into the details, but at the time people had, were sent away, they were exiled from, if they were found to have leprosy, they were exiled and sent to communities where they they would live for the rest of their lives with other people with leprosy and like they would just be arrested at their home and taken away and the families would hold funerals for them they were declared legally dead because they knew they would never see them again this was a horrible horrible thing that was happening to people and there wasn't any treatment really except this one thing called chalmugra oil which is from a seed of a tree Um, and it's the oil had been used as a, a treatment since about 300 AD, I think, in Indian and Chinese medicine. But it wasn't consistent. When it worked, it worked really well, but it wasn't consistently working. Um, So they had to kind of improve this. So it was kind of too sticky to use as an ointment. um, And it was, it tasted so disgusting that even if somebody managed to swallow it, they would just throw it up, rendering it completely useless. Um, And if it was injected into the skin, because it's an oil, it didn't mix with, you know, where mostly water, it didn't mix and it would just sit under the skin and cause blisters, which uh, I think the quote is appeared as if their skin had been replaced with bubble wrap and it wouldn't work and it would be very painful. Um, So obviously this needed improving and I feel like I have to stick it here. I'm not a chemist, so I'm going to do my best to explain this part um, and we'll see what happens but essentially she had to isolate the active ingredients so what you can see here on the picture on the screen is uh the two um fatty acids that are the active ingredients in the chamugra oil that actually had the uh treatment effects and the idea is let's see if i can get this right so you would this is what you wanted to end up with but to get there you had all of these fatty acids attached a, a base um of glycerol so you would treat it with a base or an alkali uh, to remove the glycerol um, and separate the fatty acid salts. Then you would add an acid to get acids from the salts. You would add um, hydrogen ions to get the acids from the salt. And then you would uh, use ethyl esters. So um, I think I'm right saying this is okay, ethanol. Uh, which would remove the salts from the the mixture that you now had because they were concerned that if salt got into the bloodstream, the blood would then try and absorb too much water and the blood cells would would break, basically, which they didn't want to happen. Um, And so this basically, probably a much more complicated version of that, uh, became the way that uh, they could treat the symptoms of um, leprosy or Hansen's disease. Um, And really sadly uh she actually died in 1916 aged only 24 um before she was able to publish any of this work um so there was an accident she was during the world war one and they were she was demonstrating the correct usage of a gas mask to a group of students um and there was an accident and she inhaled a lot of chlorine um and became immediately ill and died later that year age only 24 which is horrible um and then just really you know kicking the teeth is after her death, the present university continued her work, understandably, it's important work, um, except he never acknowledged that that's what he was doing, that he'd continued on from the work of somebody else. And the sources that I managed to find have, find have also said that he named the method that was developed, Dean's method, after himself, um, which is quite conceited and not really the done thing. Um, but... Uh, Six years later, fortunately, the colleague that originally contacted Alice Ball to ask her to work with him to to isolate this 
published some work and put that right and said that Alice Ball was the one who did it. And actually, I found a lot of this information from a uh, this particular picture from a blog by the Bumbling Biochemist. It was a really interesting read. But she points out here um, the moment in the paper where uh, Holman c calls out Dean, uh, saying, I cannot see that there is any improvement whatsoever over the original technique as worked out by Miss Ball, uh, because the additions that um, Dean made just made it no different, but now harder to be done on for smaller places with less money. We're now unable to create the same um, uh, result. Um, so even though she was told it was okay, uh, sorry, even though six years later, uh, the work was published saying that it was her, she wasn't actually, she's still not really remembered as the person who came up with this. Um, and until 2000, so 90 years later nearly, uh, she was recognised by the University of Hawaii and they put a, a plaque on the Chalmuga tree on the grounds remembering her and what she did. Um, she received a posthumous medal of distinction in 2007 and there's now a scholarship that's been set up in her honour at the University of Hawaii. And actually people in Hawaii remember her much more than we do. They actually um, designated in 2000, designated uh, February 29th Alice Ball Day and they celebrate that uh, every four years. Uh, so she's much better remembered and she should be because uh, although the treatment that she came up with wasn't perfect, it didn't last, you know, eventually bacteria became resistant to it, but uh, that it was the most widely used one until the 40s. In fact, they only used one until the 40s when antibiotic treatments were, were, were brought about. Um, and she saved thousands of lives like she she actually allowed thousands of people were now able to leave exile and go back and live with their families and, and not be declared dead before they were because they were finally able to live and not have this um disease that people were horror, like terrified of catching so she really did make a difference in, in many many people's lives um so next up cecilia payne kaboshkin uh, so she was born in uh, Buckinghamshire and she actually went to Cambridge to study botany, uh, but she was really interested in attending Rutherford's lectures, so she ended up studying the physics course instead. Um, and she ended up getting a 2-1 uh, in her degree, which is actually a, a great grade, um, but not the first that she was expected to get because she, en she had such a big interest in astronomy that she ended up doing loads of projects on that instead of actually doing her physics work. So she managed to get an incredible grade, but, you know, concentrating on something else. Um, although actually her degree was never actually officially awarded anyway, because women didn't get degrees from Cambridge until 1947, they just didn't award them. So she was able to study it, but not actually get the degree. So her research was into the uh, basic how, what the sun is made up of. Um, so I'll go into a little bit of the science of this bit. So if you have an atom which you can picture as a nucleus with electron rings around, it's not really how they work, but for the sake of this, you can sort of picture it. So these are energy levels which an electron can sit in. And if you have a photon of light come in and hit the uh, atom, um, it can absorb that energy and bump the electron up to another energy level. But it can only do this if the photon is exactly the right energy to be able to jump up those levels. It can't sit anywhere in between. So if any photons come past and aren't the right energy to knock it into another ring, it will just keep going past and you'll never notice. Uh, but if it does, then it will be absorbed and it won't make it past the atom until later when the electron, um, when the atom no, when the electron drops back down and releases that energy as a photon itself, which is released in any, like all sorts, any direction. So the reason this is useful is because the solar interior emits white light. So that's all the colours of the spectrum um, all together, and that looks white. And then any atoms in the solar exterior um, will then absorb some of that light and it's almost like a fingerprint so different atoms absorb different things so you can tell what's there by looking at these absorption patterns so by the time it reaches earth we'll see something that looks more like the line in the middle there with the black lines taken out and that's what's been absorbed so this is a really simplified picture of the spectrum because what the solar atmosphere actually looks like is this uh, so this is the spectrum of the solar atmosphere with the wavelengths taken out of the atoms that are absorbed and before the, before Cecilia payne kaposchkin started her research, this it had been thought that the sun was just a really hot version of Earth, like we were made up of the same things. 
Um, but then in her PhD thesis, she found that actually hydrogen and helium were dominant um, and hydrogen was actually a million times more abundant in the sun than was originally thought. So there's quite a big difference between the makeup of the sun and the earth. The sun is not just a really hot version of earth. Um, but she was a PhD student at the time and we have a tendency to just do what our supervisors tell us to do. Um, and the supervisor told her that nobody was going to accept that. It can't be right. Her exam I think it was her examiner would just was to have none of it. Um, and so in her thesis, she actually ended up arguing that this couldn't possibly be the case um, and why she must be wrong about this. Um, and later on, somebody else, Henry Norris Russell, came to the same conclusion via a different method. And to his credit, he did acknowledge that Peng Poshkin had found this earlier, um, but he's still usually credited with the discovery rather than her. Um, and I just love the fact that despite the fact that she spent her thesis trying to tell people she was wrong, it was still quoted as being undoubtedly the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy, um, which is quite the accolade. Um, so she actually, she carried on in academia, even though this, this happened in her PhD. Um, she didn't actually have an official position from 1927 to 38, even though she was at the university and lecturing. Uh, her courses that she taught didn't go at knowledge until 1945, um, but then she later became the first female professor at Harvard and the first woman to head a department at Harvard. Um, so she ended up doing doing very well, but it was still incredibly unfair that uh, she just doesn't get remembered for the, the discovery that she made. And then finally, uh, I'd like to talk about Chen Sheng Wu. And she was born near Shanghai in China in 1912. And she was quite lucky in that her father believed in education for girls, which wasn't a common idea at the time. So she was actually able to attend a school which he started um, for, for girls to be able to attend. She was a very, very good student um, and she was very involved in student politics. And actually her peers chose her to lead a lot of the protests because she was such a good student. They assumed that her involvement would just be overlooked because nobody wanted to get rid of the person who was bringing in um, all this amazing research, even at uni. Um, so she started, uh, she moved to the University of Michigan, um, but then she moved to Berkeley because she found out that women couldn't use the front entrance of the University of Michigan at the time, um, which she was having none of, quite rightly. Uh, so she moved to Berkeley instead. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that she did. And this needs a, little, a couple of little background bits. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to do them justice. So first off, you need to know about the weak nuclear force. So there are four fundamental forces, the weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, electromagnetic force and gravity. Um, we all know about electromagnetic and gravity. Strong nuclear force holds together atoms. And the weak nuclear force uh, is kind of a harder one to explain. So. You have, you know, matter, which is made up of atoms, molecules, they're made up of protons and neutrons and electrons. And then neutrons, and protons and a few other things are made up of these things called quarks. Um, and quarks have quite cool names. So they're up, down, top, bottom, strange and charm are the different types of quarks. And specifically looking at protons and neutrons, a neutron is made of a down, down and an up quark. And a proton is made of an up, up and a down quark. And the weak interaction is basically the force that allows the quarks to change flavor, which is what the, the types are called. So in a neutron, if a down quark were to change to an up quark, then the neutron would become a proton. Um, and this actually happens in a process called beta decay. So let's say you had a cesium nuclei um, and it emitted an electron. Basically what's happened there is a down quark in a neutron has changed to an up quark in a proton. Um, and then emitted a, an electron um, so that you can now see that the total number of um, particles in the nucleus is the same, 137, but now the atomic number is one higher at 56 for barium um, because now there's an extra proton and that electron's gone because charge has to be conserved. So the electron plus the proton cancel each other out and make the neutron that was there originally. And that's beta decay. So next we move on to parity. And I think if you saw my talk at Cosmology Night, um, you'll know that this is where maybe I fall down slightly. So I, re I really want to include Chen Sheng Wu because her story is just uh, really fascinating. But 
I kind of struggle with the concept of parity, so I'll do my best to explain this to you. Um, so the idea of parity is that if, if it's conserved, if we had our universe and a mirror image of our universe, they would behave in exactly the same way. There would be no difference. There would be no, so if you have, if you, you've probably looked at your hands before, uh, if you put them together, you know, they're the same, but you can't overlay them on top of each other. They just won't match. And that's called chirality. The idea is that if parity is conserved, we, we don't have chirality. It would be exactly the same um, when you flip the coordinates. And it had always been assumed this was true. But then it was suggested that that's not always the case. And for example, in the weak for in the weak interaction, maybe parity isn't conserved. So we needed a way to test it. So the way that you can do that is if you take a cobalt nucleus and you place it within a solenoid, which is a really tightly wrapped uh, coil of wire, which is really hard to draw in PowerPoint, but I tried. Um, and you put the cobalt inside solenoid, you apply a magnetic field in one direction and you cool it right down to cryogenic temperatures. If parity is conserved, you should expect that when cobalt 60 decays through beta decay, that the electrons will all will be emitted in all directions. Uh, but when they actually tried the experiment, that's not what happened. The electrons were actually all emit or mostly emitted in the direction opposite to that of the magnetic field which showed that parity wasn't in fact conserved in the case of the weak interaction. So the theory for this was actually put forward by two uh, male scientists, Sung Dao Li and Chen Ning Yang, um, and they predicted theoretically that it wouldn't be conserved and they needed it to be shown. So they came to Chen Sheng Wu, who came up with the experiment. She performed the experiment, designed it, and then and showed that their predictions were, were true. And despite the fact that three people can win a Nobel Prize and that there was precedent for, you know, the, the theoretical and experimental side of a um, discovery to come together and win it together, she not only was not included in the list of winners, um, she wasn't even acknowledged in her part in, in helping, which is just incredibly unfair. And now you can see why I keep her in, even though maybe my explanation of parody isn't the best. Um, because I think her story absolutely needs to be told. So that's the final person that I wanted to tell you about. Um, but I said earlier, you know, it's not a past problem. Um, things are a lot better than they used to be. I, I don't, I would never have to publish under my boyfriend's name. I don't have to come up with a pseudonym to pretend that I'm a man or just use my initials to be able to get published. But just anecdotally, you can see it, right? You can see when you go to, uh, a, specifically for physics, this is because I, I don't know about other conferences, but you can go to a physics conference and it's kind of, you have to play spot the woman a little bit. You know, there, there really aren't many um, women at, at, in physics conferences. And that's just anecdotally, but actually there was a study fairly recently that looked at 9.7 million papers by 36.6 million authors. And they looked at the gender of all the authors and this wasn't a perfect study don't get me wrong you know that they, they couldn't necessarily say the gender of everybody um and they predicted that 258 years before the gender ratio becomes with within five percent equal in physics even with a, an imperfect study um it still seems like a long long time uh before we would come within equal um, and there is some gender pay gap as well, you know, like if you want numbers rather than the percentages that are shown on this slide. Um, there was a survey by a new scientist where you see the gap. It was about £10,000 um, per year between male and female engineers, uh, which is actually greater than the difference last year, which I know it's only one year's worth of difference, but going that direction isn't the way we want to go. We want to go the other way, very much so. Um, and I know I've heard people in the past argue that, well, you know, there's just more men doing the positions that get paid high. You're not comparing like person to like position to position. You're comparing overall positions, which is true. But then we have to ask ourselves the question, why do we now have this disparity between the level of positions that men and women are happening and is there any uh, that are gaining and is there anything that we can do about 
the difference. Um, and there are so many other gaps in science as well. So hopefully this diversity in STEM uh, series can enlighten us on a few more. I've only, I've only concentrated on one here. Um, but yes, that's me. That's, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank, you, Thank you, Clarissa. You. That was really interesting. Um, so I'm sure our audience agrees. Um, if anyone in the audience does have any questions, then please feel free to type them in the chat box. We're going to take a quick five minute break, um, during which we will test what you have learned because I've put together a uh, women in science um, crossword for you, which I realize now a crossword on the screen, it's not ideal, but the extra challenge makes it more fun. You will, you'll find that, I'm sure. Um, but even if you don't have any questions, it's great to see so many people watching. Um, if you want to tell us where you're from, why you came this evening, um, that would be really good. Normally, all of our events are held in person. Obviously, that isn't possible at the moment, but we can still try get a bit of um, social stuff happening on the chat box, hopefully. We'll see. Um, if you watched this talk and you thought, wow, I'd love to see a woman talking about her excellent research, then you will have the opportunity if you come and watch our sidebar presentation in two weeks' time. We have a psychology researcher from the University of Sunderland, Dr. Becky Owens, and she's going to be talking about the psychology of tattoos. So why people get them, why people spend all that money on them and go through all that pain to have them and the culture around them specifically in the UK. So that's in two weeks time on the 22nd of July. And um, that should be a really great talk. So um, that's everything from me for now. Um, we will take a five minute break. We'll be back just before quarter past eight um, and enjoy the crossword. Let me know how you get on.
Hi, welcome, welcome back. back. Um, um, so, so we're going to get going, going with the question and answer session for, for Clarissa. Clarissa. Um, um, there's been lots, been lots of questions, questions in the chat, chat box, which is great. great. Um, so I'm just, so just going to dive, dive straight, straight in. in. Um, so, so someone, someone is asking, asking um, from all from your research and experience, experience how, how do you see that we can pave the way for more female sites? That is a very good question. It seems to me that, that a lot of the problems, I know it's not necessarily to do with uh, what I was just talking about, but a lot of the issues seem to come from quite a young age with getting women into science. Like they're, you're really impressionable when you're like five or six and when you walk into a toy shop and there's a big pink section that you might be directed to and that's like oh science for girls and it's like a nail art kit it's like oh cool that's okay I'm gonna learn about chemistry it's like no no it's just uh, no. this is a product that I've seen that exists and it's just it, it, there's a there's a I feel like you have to kind of go like quite early on um to be able to to help girls feel like you know it's not a thing that you can't do it's something that you know it's just normal for you to do that I think that's the thing is like normalizing women being there not being like oh, what are you like no I'm I'm here of course I'm here um, I think that a lot of it is just normalizing um, yeah I think I'd agree from what I've seen I think there's a lot of efforts that are being made to improve the numbers mm. and I think certainly I don't know if it's the same for physics, but certainly um, biology, which is my background, undergraduate degrees seem to have um, sort of gender parity. And it's sort of, it seems to be, it's always the case, the higher up you go, mm. the greater drop off you get. And it's really tricky because now, obviously, loads of efforts are being made in various areas to make things equal, which is great. But if you are already starting off from that differing point, if everything's equal, it's just going to rise at the same level and it's really tricky. But then obviously putting in um, policies and things that say we want to favour women, it would have a great impact, but I can see why some people will look down on that. So it can be really tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right, appealing to a younger generation is definitely, definitely necessary. If you don't start them young, then you're not going to get them when they get to undergraduate and beyond. So it does make sense. Um, we have another really good question here. Um, so what have you learned about the struggles of female scientists that you can benefit from in your own career? So many things. Um, it's a really good question. Um, so I think one of the things that I've kind of learned from, from researching, and this comes up particularly with um, learning about Catherine Johnson and the fact that she we got her name first on the author that wasn't just the one time she happened to be told she could do it she tried repeatedly to get her name on those papers um and somebody who um marion diamond who i didn't actually speak about in full um basically saying no no you are including my name on this paper and i think it's just i've kind of you have to nobody else is going to do it for you basically you've kind of got to got to make sure that you uh, put yourself out there for things. I think that's one of the one of the things I've noticed comes up a lot. Um, and even in the case of like, so this isn't necessarily through the research of this, but you know, even in a, applying for for jobs and positions, let 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 somebody else tell you you're not good enough, rather than assuming that you're not anyway. Because there will often be there'll be other people who aren't qualified who are applying. So, and it is quite often the case that women are not those people um so they work they'll hold back because they, they don't tick every box so they won't apply and i know i've been guilty of doing this in the past and, and i've kind of tried to be and that's it just seems to fall in with the whole um you know you've got you've got to make sure that you're heard um or and the thing is even when you make sure you're heard sometimes you're still forgotten but you can do what you can in the first place to, to try and get there yeah, definitely. If you're happy with the, the effort you've made. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, that it links to imposter syndrome. Just mm. walking into a room and thinking, I, I don't belong here. And yeah. just knowing that everyone suffers from that to some degree or another. You just have to put it aside and be like, I don't care. I might as well try. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> I've had to do that a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, ah, I'm already here, I might as well. <laughs> um, the next question we have, um, what made Marie Curie so different from the other women in science um, in her time, why did the men around her find her so difficult to ignore? Being recognised with two Nobel Prizes is almost unique. It is. It's certainly unique. And I think she's still the only person that's won chemistry and physics, right? And I have to be honest with you, I may be Googling this now. Um, I don't know. If I'm completely honest with you, I... I'm not sure what 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 she did or what the people, whether it was something she did or whether it was something that the people around her did, or she, if she worked with particularly um, not tolerant people. I don't know if that's the right word, but people who are, um, oh yeah, I'm gonna go with tolerant, particularly tolerant of having a woman in the lab or whether she herself did anything different. It's actually a really good question. And I, I don't know, I would, I would like to look into that some more. I don't know if you have any ideas. I don't, I I can't help going down the route that maybe uh, when I think of her, I can't help of someone looking down the corridor at her lab and just it glowing green. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> she's doing, she's doing something, something in there. In there. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's just like, oh, she's doing that. I, I, I don't want to go near that. She can yeah. do that. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Leave yeah. it to her. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> Um, another question here, which is one I was going to ask, actually, um, how do you go about searching for these amazing scientists? It can't be that easy discovering anyone that has been forgotten. So I think it's probably and I, I don't know this is true because I've only started doing it re fairly recently in the last few uh, year or so, maybe. Um, but it seems to me like it's something that's becoming a lot easier recently because more people are doing talks like this and blog posts like this and lists of people um, and so a lot of the ways I did is I kind of just looked up you know influential people um, and that was almost always mostly uh, men and then a couple of women and then I was looking up the couple of women and usually when you look up the couple of women you get linked to others and other blog posts that have not blog posts necessarily but articles and posts that list them and then you can kind of delve more into um where you found it for example i think in, in my talk i had the, the slides on alice ball so i found out about her um on like a, a list of um influential people and then kept looking her up and there was you know there was basically the same article on different websites almost word for word the same for a lot of them which i thought was quite interesting um but then i found that that blogger um the the bio biochemist one and um that had like the the most information on it like about the actual science which helped me because again i'm not not a chemist so that was really helpful so usually it it did take a bit of gig digging i think that took me a couple of days to find um of just constant searching uh, but usually you'll find somebody who has decided to either make themselves an expert on that person or uh, in this case, it was like 365 days of science, I think, was the, the, the piece that they were doing. So they would picked a person every day to talk about, to look at. Um, so I was able to find that. But um, you do kind of have to start broad and then usually one person will link to another and you can dig them up, um, which is quite helpful. But sometimes you have to be quite specific in your searches. Um, I did wonder, given the um, your four examples, obviously, uh, studying theoretical physics. If that was a, a big indicator of how they made the, the cut. Oh, was, what was that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the... Um, given that you're studying theoretical physics, um, is that how your four examples sort of made the cut? Yeah, I guess so. I think a lot of that was... Um, I'm studying physics. The four examples aren't physicists. And I don't... A lot of that was I want to include a lot of people. I want to include these people. I'm not confident in my ability to, ex because I want to make sure it's a science talk and I want to make sure, like I said at the start, like they shouldn't just be remembered because they were treated unfairly. They should be rem remembered because they did fantastic research. Um, and I want to try and do that research some justice. And I did think that, especially with like brain plasticity, for example, 
I'm not going to be, I can attempt parody, like, parody, I can attempt um, some chemistry, but brain plasticity, I'm staying well away from. I don't, I would love to learn more about it, but I feel like uh, it's something that's so far above. So that's actually a lot of the people that are in, not all of the people in that list are there because I can't explain their science, but um, that's that's a little bit why some of them are, are in a mention zone. I've actually got um, extra size and out of extra people that were in the last time I did the talk that are, I've just kind of, basically trying to take in and out depending on how long I've got to speak. Um, so I hope to expand it with more people in the future so that I can swap them in and out and in and out. Um, well, I must admit, I've stood in neuroscience and I, that's the first time I've heard of um, Marion Diamond. So oh. <laughs> which I get this question that I wanted to ask um, from my background in biology and neuroscience. I really noticed that I was never taught about the women in my field and nothing ever came up during my education. Mm -hmm. As I start to sort of come across them myself, I'd start noticing more as you tend to do. Um, did you find that the same in your background? Yeah, I think so. I think with physics it is, is a bit of an odd one because I think it, it's such an obvious problem with physics maybe it gets quite a lot of the attention of like we need to make a difference and fix this and teach people more which is great because you know it does need to be done but now that you mention it no throughout my degree I don't really remember I don't really remember being told many many I don't remember being told about many people so maybe that's just that but um I don't really remember ever specifically sitting down and um looking at I mean, we, we only had one female lecturer in physics when I was there. There are more now in the university that I went to, but like it, it you could kind of see it there, but it never really occurred to me um, that no, I hadn't really been taught uh, any yeah. names or any, hist any history really at all, to be honest. Um, That's it. And it, it seems so strange because particularly in science, any good science you have to follow what has come before so you're not repeating stuff you're not going down the wrong track yeah. but there seems to be it seems very recent history any further back you don't really hear about how it got to where it is now mm. uh, and it's only when you start learning about things all the things that have happened the incredible challenges like many that these women face you just think wow this yeah. it, it makes the whole field feel so different at least it does to me mm. uh, particularly comparing it to sort of my everyday versus, you know, not being allowed in the front door of the university. Like, it's just mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine. I, I like to think that if I'd have been there, I also would have moved universities because of that. I don't know if that's true because I wasn't there, but I'd, I'd like to think I would. I think a lot of us would like to think we would. But, um, yeah, I just can't imagine. I can't imagine ever being in that position. Um, I'd like to think I tried running through that door a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try and <Yes>. have. <laughs> I probably wouldn't get a degree, but I'd be really fit. So that's yeah. fine. <laughs> um, another question. So this is similar to an earlier one that we got, uh, putting you a bit on the spot here. Um, but what type of action do you think needs to be taken by the STEM community generally to sort of diversify, invite more women? I think this is a really tough question because... Um, it, you've got to strike a balance, I think we touched on it earlier, you have to kind of strike a balance between um, not tokenizing people, um, not just giving people jobs because they're, you know, you, you can't have a quota, that's not how any of this works, but at the same time, the only way you can get more women into uh, science jobs is to hire more women in science roles. Um, and I think we're, we're, at a, we're at a point now where as much as we want to go, right, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just do everything double blind. We'll do everything so we don't see any names or anything. Um, you can only go so far in science with that because at some point you have to look up their research and their papers, at which point you'll see names and details, or you have to have an interview, um, at which point you'll, you'll meet the person. Um, so you have to kind of strike a balance between like I, I don't like the I, I don't like the idea that I'd, I'd ever get a job because I'm a woman and I, I hate the fact that sometimes people will assume that 
Um, I've never had that, fortunately. I've never had someone assume that about me. I've certainly read stories and heard other people say that they've had people say to them, you only got this job because. Um, I don't think that should ever be the case. But at the same time, when you've got to do... If you had two people that were completely equally qualified and no difference whatsoever, do, do you make the choice based on gender? Th I don't... It's such a hard question to answer because you're always going to be I, I like I say I really I actually really hate the idea of, of yeah, well you got the job because you're a woman which I'm sure most women do um uh so it's it's kind of a really I'd like to come up with a really good way of doing this I feel like if I could come up with a really good way of doing it it'd solve a lot of problems so <laughs> um yeah, I suppose if it was something that could be easily solved you'd assume it had been done by now yeah one would hope yeah, progress has been made. Um, things like the Athena Swan Award at universities, mm. um, which when I first heard about that, we had a, a lot of emails going around the department asking people to suggest ways to improve this. And I thought, I, I don't, I can't think of any. Surely it's all, it's all been done. And then the more you look into it, the more you start realizing the things that can be done, like um, mixed sex interview panels and things like that so you're not having a, a female walking into an all-male panel or vice mm. versa just little things that you don't realize how intimidating and off-putting it can be until it happens yeah uh, so, so small cause, <laughs> hmm. yeah because like you say it, what one it's like it's intimidating walking in and being like i don't fit in here oh no um and i don't want to fit in here not not i don't want to fit in here but like i don't want to be here if i'm going to be the I mean, you kind of get used to it after a while, like being the only woman in a place, it's fine. Um, but there's also that thing of like, people kind of are more likely to hire someone that's similar to them and they think will fit in. And, and whether it's consciously or unconsciously, you, so some people don't necessarily fit into that description for others. Um, yeah, I suppose it positives and negatives that having people similar that's going to fit in is great but as um we're trying to point out in this series and some people have pointed out in the chat diversity is really important you need mm -hmm. them different outlooks different cultures different backgrounds to really bring so much more and it's so beneficial in science absolutely yeah there's uh, nothing more dangerous than uh, oh well it's always been this way so yeah <laughs> And I have to admit, I have reverted to that a few times because when you're feeling lazy, it's hard not to. <laughs> um, I think that covers all of the questions in the chat. So I'm just going to ask you one final question, which I realise probably a little bit inappropriate as this whole talk of trying to celebrate women in science and raise them up all equally. But if there is one female in science that you would hope to aspire to and be like, who would it be? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think if I look at like the people who I spoke about here, I love, the, I'm going to try not to cop out all of them, they're fantastic role models, um, but of the people I'm looking over here because I've got the names written down. Um, probably, to be fair, Catherine Johnson and her just tenacity and ability to get things done and to be just she, people checked computers against her like that's fantastic I don't expect ever to be that good at maths but um to be able to go into a place and, and I'm sure so I you know I've seen hidden figures I don't know how many other people were I'm sure she had it way worse than that film ever made out um and she stuck out and and did the thing she was amazing at and made an incredible difference to to space travel and I just think that's that's yeah, pretty pretty amazing. But also, as, a, as, as to add on to the cover answer, they're all pretty inspiring. <laughs> so, like Alice Ball, for example, like the re the reason she she died was because she was trying to help people by demonstrating something, and like that's just I know I know it was an accident, but you know she was trying to help and she put herself in a dangerous situation to do so, and um, it's just completely it's it's inspiring. Really. Yeah, definitely. And it's a, a good answer that what they did to put that on the moon just it I can't wrap my head around it. It's no. <laughs> any it, sense. <laughs> she just did the did calculations with the chalk. Like it's <laughs> amazing. 
Crazy. Well, um, I think that covers all of the questions. Thank you so much for that great talk. It was really interesting. Um, thank, thank you for giving up your time. No, thank you very much for having me. And hopefully, um, in the future, I'm sure we'll ask you back to hear about your research as well. Yes. <laughs> I'll have to come up with something to say about that. But yes, <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> great. Um, so that's it, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just to reiterate, as I said, if anyone has any comments or questions about um, this new series, Diversity in STEM, or about any of our events, then please do get in touch. Um, you can go to our webpage or you can follow us on any of the social media, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I think that's everywhere we are. Um, yeah, if you have any ideas, um, please get in contact. Also, we are looking for volunteers. We are as I said, a uh, not-for-profit group of volunteers. We put this together in our spare time. So if you'd like to get involved, please get in contact as well. And finally, um, if you want to learn um, more science, then please join us in two weeks' time on the 22nd of July. Um, we'll have Dr. Becky Owen talking to us about the psychology behind tattooing and why people do it. So thank you for joining us. Hopefully you enjoyed it and I will see you again next